coming up. It's an iconic image for Bristol Bay, but it also represents so much. Beautiful, but dangerous, in use long after safer power boats were on the market. It was uh, difficult for those fishermen to work, and many died uh, every, every year. So the question is, why did the sailboats continue to be used? They were obsolete. The answer may surprise you. Ahead, the Iron Men in wooden boats, why their story is part of Alaska's story, the Iron Men of Bristol Bay. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. I hope in this program you'll discover how fascinating Alaska's fisheries are. Science, politics, class struggles, true grit, adventure, all rolled up in one. And in this show, we travel back in time to the early days of the Bristol Bay fishery when they sailed for salmon. Once, there were thousands of these boats in Bristol Bay, called double-enders because the front and back of the boat had the same shape. Now, you can only find a few, like this one on display in Port Allsworth. And here we have the Santa Maria stove that, that was a coal burning. The Italian fishermen favored that. This double ender sailed for the Libby cannery. Back then, fishermen would stay out in the bay for a whole week before they delivered their salmon. And this is a foxhole. This is where the men would sleep. Historians like John Branson have tried to salvage the history of these boats. To learn more, he directed us to Tim Troll. It's an iconic image for Bristol Bay. Who collaborated with history buffs like himself to put together this book, Sailing for Salmon. The last sailboats were probably fishing in 1954, maybe. There were a few still out there. The sailboat had a long run in Bristol Bay, from 1884 to 1951, more than 60 years. Along with the double-enders came big sailing ships full of immigrants from all over the world who had fishing in the blood. It's the boat that started the commercial fishery. But the story beyond the boat is why did it last so long? That is the big question. Why did the sailboats continue to be used? They were obsolete for at least the last 35 years of their history. Elsewhere in the nation, motorized boats were on scene in the 1920s, but the federal government banned their use in the Bristol Bay fishery until 1951. And it's through that boat you kind of see that story because, in essence, many fishermen were little more than indentured servants. And there wasn't much they could do about it other than accept their lot. It was uh, what we call the lament of the Italian fishermen, and you can just imagine this, uh, you know, we pull it a net to make it a man, to buy it a bread, to get it a strength, to pull it a net. I mean, it just is, sort of describes life, doesn't it? We work to get the strength to continue working. At the whim of tides and winds, it was hard for sailboats to move easily across the bay, but motorboats would have given them the ability to go from cannery to cannery and asked for better prices. It kept the fishermen under control, and as you know, some would, would, would probably snidely say, well, it was cheaper to replace an Italian fisherman than it was to replace a boat. It also would have been expensive for the canneries to convert their sailing fleet to boats with engines. So they lobbied hard in Washington, D.C. to keep the ban on motorized fishing boats. Add insult to injury, the double-enders had to line up and wait for a power boat to tow them out to their fishing grounds. The way it was sugar-coated, that it was um, a conservation measure to make sure we don't take too many salmon. But you had hundreds of boats out there and some very good fishermen. Um, so they were still getting quite a bit of salmon. So when did the fishermen say, we don't buy that argument anymore? <laughs> They're not that dumb, I don't think. No, they're, they're not that dumb. 
two major things happened that sort of did the flip in, in, in Bristol Bay and sort of began to shake up at least the power, that kind of power that the canneries had. The first was World War II, which sent fishermen off to a war that was highly mechanized. I mean, uh, tanks and iron ships and everything, and then here we are, we're going to come back and fish in these sailboats. Then came something completely unexpected. There is one event, we call it the Bloody Fifth of July of 1948. The Bloody, the bloody Fifth, Fifth of, of July. July. It was at the peak of the season. Uh, so July 4th, July 5th is when, you know, generally we see that the sockeye are at their peak. Hundreds of thousands are coming back. And so it was just at the peak uh, when the sailboats are all out in the bay, a big storm comes uh, out of the southwest. Troll says the boats were stranded on sandbars, some flipped over, and at least five fishermen drowned. It was such a traumatic event for fishermen who felt this is ridiculous. This wouldn't have happened if we had motors. When fishermen successfully overturned the ban on motorized fishing boats, soon thereafter, the double-enders disappeared. Some native elders, like the late Harvey Samuelson, questioned Tim Troll's desire to preserve the double-enders' history. You know, we spent a long time trying to get rid of those blank boats. And now you want to bring one back? <laughs> Tim Troll did bring a boat back to Dillingham for display, but now he hopes to have a recently restored double-ender sail from Homer to Knack-Neck. It's an adventure. It would cross Cook Inlet, take a portage road to Lake Iliamna, with stops and villages along the way to Knack-Neck, weather permitting, at most, a two-week trip. The fascination with these boats is more than nostalgia. There's a lesson in what happened to the double-enders, a lesson Alaskans should never forget. World War II created a labor shortage, which brought more Alaska natives into the fishery, which helped bring momentum to the fight to end the sailboat era. But take note of this. Come next summer, a rare sight, a double-ender in the water. It'll take off from Homer on July 5th and is expected to arrive in Naknek in time for the community's annual festival celebration. So who were the men who sailed in these wooden boats? And why did they say that they were made of iron? How they earned that reputation when we come back. Recently, we brought Tim Troll and Bob King into our studios, two history buffs who say Bristol Bay had its own gold rush well before the Klondike in 1896. It began with the first cannery in Bristol Bay. A San Francisco businessman built it in 1883 at Canulek, a small Yupik village on the Nushagak River. And then came the Iron Men in wooden boats, strong enough and tough enough to sail for salmon. In your book, Sailing for Salmon, Tim, you have a lot of pictures of these sailboats, and it certainly looks romantic to see, see these images, but was it really that romantic? <laughs> well, I like this quote uh, that I ended it with from uh, El Andre, who took a, actually many of the photographs that are in the book, and he says, as I look back on the sailboats as foolish, hateful, and dangerous, romantic, and beautiful, nothing will ever compare with the lovely sight of those great winged graceful boats scudding with the wind across Bristol Bay. But he was more than willing to get into a powerboat. And I think that's certainly the impression I had mm -hmm. when right. talking to some of these guys. I said, well, we just didn't know any better. But, but if I had a choice, I'm not going back to sailboats. <laughs> Although Johnny Nick, uh, Johnny John, Nick Johnny, right. John Nicholson from, uh, from Dillingham, who fished in his career 64 seasons, uh, throughout th throughout his, his lifetime, always said he preferred fishing from, from sailboats because you don't know really how to fish. What's the quote you have? Well, I may be old-fashioned, but still believe that it's only those guys who know how to harness the wind who really know how to fish. And what Johnny said is when you got rid of the sailboats, all the pencil pushers could come in and fish. The lawyers, the doctors who didn't, I mean, they would have never been able to have survived the rigors of being in a sailboat 24 hours a day six days a week, that it, uh, it would be a, an entirely different fishery. Can you give us, Bob, a sense of, of what life was like as they passed time? 
on these wooden boats? Fishermen in Bristol Bay are out there for maybe a month or so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they'll spend a week or so getting their boat ready to go. They'll fish for a couple of weeks to, right during the peak and then pack their boat up and leave, uh, go, go someplace else. Back then, it took a month to get on one of the sailing ships that took them from San Francisco or Seattle to get up to get up to Bristol Bay. It took them a month to get the cannery put together because you have on that boat, you had uh, you had all of the uh, cannery workers. Everybody had to come and get the, the cannery ready to go. Then the salmon finally came. You fish for maybe a month. After that, you have to uh, take the cannery down, pack up the boats, and leave, and it takes another month. The Bristol Bay fishing season back then was uh, started in May and it ended in September. <laughs> and and again, now it's it, it's not it doesn't last much longer than the uh, middle uh, middle of July. Well, those double ender sailboats that they use, they don't look like they have a lot of room in them. But these fishermen had to pretty much camp out in them almost. What well, was that did. like? Well, Bob, chime in here, but uh, if I understand correctly, I mean, usually it was six days a week, if you say six days a week, and it probably changed throughout the years. But the cannery would load you up in the beginning, so would give you your food, a box of food, uh, your stove, all the gear, you know, your pilot bread or whatever. Uh, if you're an Italian, lots of spaghetti, I would assume. And that would last you for six days. But also when you delivered... Uh, to a tally scow, which was a whole nother thing. Oftentimes, now, what's a, a tally scow? Uh, that was where you actually delivered the fish, and you you had a pew or a pick, and you would fling the fish up. You see photos of this, and the, it was called a tally scow because you'd have a man there with a little uh, tally. They paid by the fish, back by the then, fish, not by right. the pound. <laughs> so they, uh, they 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 kept count. As, so they. Loaded on tally They'd scale. be fling around, the tally man would be sitting there counting them and then say, tally when he got to 100 and tally when he got to 200. But oftentimes they could get a meal on a tally scow or right. a bunk scow, uh, warm meal when they delivered fish. But the, the season, like Tim said, it, was, uh, it started out, it was seven days a week. Um, there were later reductions of that, but that was until the 1920s. Other than that, you're sleeping on your boat, you're uh, cooking. Uh, on your boat, you'd have what they called a Swede stove. Tim was talking about, uh, you know, some some burned coal the and coal stoves. And, yeah, Dago uh, stoves they call them, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, brew some coffee, cook their uh, uh, cook their dinners. Off, oftentimes, I bet they ate fish. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they. Yeah, what else would you eat, right? Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> handy. Spaghetti. They'd get the catch of the day. <laughs> uh -huh. So, tell us a little bit about how they interacted with the canneries. Was this a, a healthy relationship? Well, the first uh, Alaska Fishermen's Union was formed in Bristol Bay, and I think it was about 1904, 1903, and that was the first attempt of the fishermen to organize, impose you know, better standards, argue about prices, of course. And back when they started, the early the early contracts around 1904, they're paid uh, three cents a fish, which is about half a penny a pound, and uh, and the like. So they'd argue about prices, they'd argue about labor conditions. The fishermen and the canneries, I think, did have a, a relationship, but they also depended upon each other, and they had to come together to, uh, in order to get this fish, especially in such a short period of time. So let's talk about the records that you've been collecting and trying to find, because apparently there are quite a few of them to be found and looked at. Where did you start? There are lots of different sources, uh, records in the National Archives, records down in San Francisco mm -hmm. at the uh, Maritime the Museum. Museum. I was up recently in uh, Bellingham, where the uh, University Archives uh, there in Western Washington University, they had boxes and boxes of these records of individual fishermen uh, from about 1904 to uh, 1940. That's the Alaska yeah. Packers Association. Yeah, this is just the Alaska Packers Association, but they were cards and they would identify the, the fishermen, they would talk about them. A rare few of them had pictures of some of the individuals, but they had records. They really paint a very vivid picture of, of who these fishermen were and what they did. Well, you kind of cherry-picked some, some records uh, in mm -hmm. various 
presentations that you've given. And so maybe let's go through some of the photos that, that you have and images of, of the records themselves. Yeah, they identify on, on all these cards where the country they came from. There were fishermen from Croatia, from Greece. There was one from, one from Algeria. There are also lots of Norwegians, mostly in the, in the, the Seattle area. There were Swedes, there were Finns, Germans, Danes, Russians. There was one guy from Australia we found. There are some from the States as well. And there are cards uh, that were assigned to uh, the native fishermen who uh, the APA also hired. The canneries list where they work. The boats that they sailed on, they're all sailing on the, uh, the sailboats. They're all called star of this, star of that. Right, for the Alaska Packers Association, they started out with these uh, three-masted barks. These are these large ships, a couple hundred feet long. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is the whole cannery crew, the fishermen, the, the processing workers, everybody. They got the name Star of whatever place. Star because, of India. <laughs> Star of Alaska. <laughs> Star of Alaska. They actually bought the, the first, one of the first of the star boats yeah. around, around the turn of the 20th century. And the company officials liked the name so much they started renaming all their boats the Star of This, the Star of That. Yeah, and that's Star a of Norway. Well, that's a whole other story. I mean, the, you know, basically these, these tall ships survived probably 20 years, 25 years past their working life because of Bristol Bay. Um, because many of these boats were cheap to run and cheap to operate, and you still had people like Norwegians and Swedes and who could sail these things. Uh, and they weren't really replaced by the steamers until probably the 30s, uh, when we finally see the last of the starships uh, in the late 1920s. So what are the records that you find the most interesting, the most revealing? Well, these records list where, the, where every individual fisherman uh, worked. They, the canneries would write down that, you know, such and such a fisherman was insubordinate and he didn't follow the rules and was, in their words, was a troublemaker <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the like. And they listed injuries, they listed violations of the law, they listed deaths. How would they die? Uh, they would drown, probably. That would be typical. What was really interesting about the, these cards to me was the uh, individual catch data. They would write down on every card uh, how many fish that that fisherman and his partner would put up every year. Back then, they were uh, counting fish by the individual uh, fish, not, not, one by, not one. by pound. And so you'd see numbers of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. 10,000, these are approximately six pound fish. So if you see that a, a guy catch, uh, would catch 10,000 fish, that's 60,000 pounds. 20,000 fish. That's 120,000 pounds. I found one card in there of a guy, an Italian guy, who fished out, out of Igigik. He's actually from San Francisco. I found him in the, in the census. One year he caught 40,000 fish, and one year he caught 45,000 fish. That's 280,000 pounds of fish that he caught by hand, pulled the net in by hand. Again, you're, you're talking just two guys working on a sailboat. Now you have five people on, on, on some of these modern Bristol Bay gill netters. And the thing to think about too is the challenge is back then, of course, you had no motor. So motorized power would allow you to, of course, move around the bay where people see fish jumping. These are guys that simply had to go with the tide. You were going in or you were going out with the tide. So basically, you didn't have a lot of mobility to catch that many fish, for one, which, of course, you have much more mobility today. So it's pretty remarkable to find that guy. Do you call <laughs> these men in, in your presentations that you've given the Iron Men, the Iron Men of Bristol Bay? Right. Back then, you had uh, the men working in w wooden boats were Iron Men because everything was manual. They pulled nets on by hand. They tossed their fish into the tally scow by hand. They had to raise the, the, the masts, raise the sails. Everything was by hand. And they really were strong men and deserved the title, uh, the reputation of being the Iron Men of Bristol Bay. There are unfortunately no photos of that superstar Italian fisherman whose records Bob King found in the archives. His name was Gennaro Camporeale. 
This Camry card is from 1917, but he actually started fishing in Igigek three years before that and worked at least 19 seasons in Bristol Bay. And during that time, Gennaro landed about a half a million sockeyes. Well, the canneries have a fascinating story of their own, and in a future Frontiers program, we'll take you to the old NN cannery in South Naknek, once a bustling little city in the wilderness, now a rickety ghost town. Up next, we remember a Sitka man who followed his passion. The female is unmistakable. She's wearing her prom dress. How Richard Nelson's wide-eyed curiosity and love of nature made a big difference in our state. Richard Nelson's voice went quiet this week. He died at the age of 77. It was a voice that brightened the airwaves on public radio in Sitka, where he enthusiastically shared his love of nature. On his website, EncountersNorth.org, he is featured in videos like this one. What we have here in this pool is a group of chum salmon. They're also called dog salmon in Alaska. Right here, a number of pairs of chum salmon have got themselves arranged ready for spawning. The female is unmistakable. She's wearing her prom dress. A prom dress, huh? Liz McKenzie, Richard Nelson's longtime creative collaborator, says that she will continue to post new material on his website, EncountersNorth.org, where you can also find Nelson's archive of stories and get a shot of his boundless enthusiasm. And there will soon be information on the website about how you can help Nelson's colleagues carry on his work. Well, joining us now, Rick Steiner, a friend of Richard Nelson to share a, a few memories. What are some of your favorite? Well, you know, Richard Nelson was a real cultural treasure for Alaska in many ways. And I knew him, first met him about 40 years ago, and he was sort of a, a colleague and a mentor to me when I was moving out to northwest Alaska. And you're a biologist. I'm a biologist. Trade. I was moving to northwest Alaska. He helped me understand the cultural context that I was moving into and that I would be working with then. And, you know, his legacy is sort of as a communicator between worlds. He understood the depth and wisdom of Alaska Native subsistence culture 50 years ago and, and communicated that to the Western scientific world and the public brilliantly. And I think that's a lot of where this current concept of traditional ecological knowledge in government policy came from. And then he he evolved into a communicator of the beauties and wonders, these childlike wonders of the natural world to the public and that those two legacies are profound all right well i want to thank you very much rick stein i wish we had more time to hear more about he will be missed a man who will indeed be missed well before we leave you some words of thanks to the alaska moving image preservation association and the film archives at the university of alaska fairbanks for use of their footage. And we also want to thank the Luzak Library for use of the Ann Stevens Room, one of Anchorage's hidden gems. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.